Thank you so much for uh, everyone that was able to join us today. This is our webinar. It's Lessons from National Protest Strategies for, Strategies for Curriculum and Community Engagement. This webinar is being sponsored by the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, the voice you've been hearing thus far and the faces uh, you're probably looking at as well, um, but my name is Nkenji Friday. I'm the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Strategic Initiatives in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. And I'd like to give a chance for my colleague to introduce herself as well. Hi everyone, my name is Helen Fagan. I'm the Director of Leadership Engagement at Rural Futures Institute and an Assistant Professor of Practice in the Agricultural Leadership Education Communication Department at UNL. So we want to thank you um, for joining us today. Uh, when we first talked about this webinar, there was a, um, a resounding uh, number of emails, a lot of interest that we received, and we were very grateful for that. Um, because I think that especially as we're framing this topic and as we're thinking about um, where is our place in this conversation on anti-racism, race equity, but most importantly, as we're looking at these national protests unfold, we wanted to be a part of that conversation and to provide resources. So as we get started, just to let you know, we are, of course, um, representing this being sponsored by the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. This office provides the vision, leadership and advocacy in fostering inclusive, equitable, and welcoming campus that's central uh, to the land grant mission, mission of UNL. And what you're seeing there is a piece of the statement that was released by I Vice Chancellor a few days following uh, the framing of the national protest. And part of we wanted to frame this, conversa this conversation as we have been noting uh, the, um, this time that we're living in, these moments, and to just indicate to you, first and foremost, that as we're thinking about this as Nebraskans, but as an institution, our goal is to provide resources for our campus, for our community to engage in these conversations generally, but also with the guys that you need. So as we're thinking about that, just know that that link right there on your screen, go.unl.edu slash echoing call. This will be a resource and an actual web page that, um, that is evolving, that we fill with resources from across the campus, re resources from across the globe, designed to help you in wherever your respective roles are, faculty, staff, student, community leader, so that these conversations that we're starting to frame, that you have the support that you need. You're also backed by some of the most recent, um, I should say the most recent research, but also on the ground uh, information available for uh, times such as this. So this is of course offered by the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, but also members of our campus and so many of our leaders as well. Next slide, please. So today, as we're framing this, the national protests, of course, uh, in support of racial justice have escalated. Um, and there's been significant increase for calls for education surrounding anti-racism and race equity standards. And for many of you, perhaps you've heard the term anti-racism, um, but this is for many that could be a new phenomenon. And so as we're thinking about this, our goal is to divine, define some key terminology for you, provide a framework, um, based on the current social, sociopolitical climate. And then we also want to start having you think about, uh, provide this own internal assessment that's going to be needed for you to effectively comprehend, but also prepare to have these own, your own dialogues, your own strategies to actually incorporate this into your respective areas of work or even your personal professional lives so that you can impact that change, especially again, as these situations have now become more global. We also want to provide you some strategies to incorporate anti-racism and race equity principles into standards of community engagement, communi uh, communication, and the curriculum. So before we get started with all of this information, what is your role at UNL? We had quite a bit of people that signed up, so we're gonna give you a few seconds and a poll um, will be indicated on your screen in a few seconds. What is your role at UNL? Are you faculty, staff, student, other, such as a postdoc, or are you a friend of UNL, which could be a community member as far as Montana or as close as Lincoln. So what is your role at UNL? Faculty, staff, student, other, or a friend of UNL? Give you a few more seconds to complete this poll. And there we go. It seems it's 25% of our attendees are faculty, 60% are staff, 5% are student, 
3% others such as postdoc, and then we have 7% considered friend of UNL. Thank you so much for that. And now we're gonna do some definitions and then reframing, of course, um, of this situation. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier, which is anti-racism. And as we're thinking about anti-racism, for many of us, uh, our automatic default is to perhaps think of anti-racism as the opposite of racism. But in actuality, what we want you to start thinking about is anti-racism anti as being an actual action. So being racist or anti-racist is not about who you are. It is about what you do. So part of what we're gonna talk about a lot today is more so action-based and removing ourselves from definitions such as, or as categories such as racism or et cetera. We're gonna think about this more and what our actions will follow and then how we can be more, of course, equitable in our thinking of race and being more advocates and not just passive when we're thinking about this. And so we're also gonna talk a little bit framing this in terms of critical race theory um, critical race theory is essentially a lens to deconstruct oppressive policies and practices and essentially in short you're thinking and you're looking at everything through race meaning you have to analyze even policies based on how how does it impact race etc and then of course racism we're thinking about that definition as a system um, of advantage based on race and this is perpetuated through institutions policies practices etc and then race equity and then systemic racism. And we hear this probably, you're gonna hear this term a lot or terminology, systemic racism, but essentially it's a system in which public policies, institutional practices, cultural representation, the entire system itself um, has been obviously used, used to reinforce ways to perpetuate racial group inequity, which benefits of course, or disadvantages those within that entire system. And there are some few examples here as to how we can think about this or how this applies to our current, um, our current society or even our structures that exist. But these definitions be critical to think about as you're thinking about race and as you're framing it for your own uh, personal or your professional lens. It's so important to think about these definitions and how they manifest in different ways. Next slide, please. So why are these protests different. Um, there have been many conversations at this point and their framing of, the, of, of what's happening is largely based on where you're sitting and, and the way you're looking at uh, the socio-political system or the climate. Um, but in short, these protests have been labeled as different for a number of reasons. Uh, there's been significant uprisings in the past three weeks. Where we've seen uh, over all 50 states, um, there have been at least one, at least one protest held each day now. And then we're also starting to see this trickle into, of course, the, the lens of college campuses. But in short, these protests feel and look different for people just because these conversations have been, of course, at the cusp of what we do or what we thought about. But these, but these uprisings are in short are so different because of the attention that has now uh, been given to these protests, but also the conversations that have followed. Um, it's forced many of us who perhaps never thought about or talked about race at length to really start to examine the reasons behind that and also to start confront that own, that own issue. And then as we're seeing some of our own students perhaps, um, even probably even members of our family take their own stance regarding this, it has forced us in the United States in particular to really start to think about race and what it means for those based on one, the color of skin, but also the inequities that are associated with that. And as you're seeing, this being toppled of course, with a current uh, health pandemic called COVID-19, this has only exacerbated that as well. So those inequities have now manifested, have uh, taken hold of the racial inequities that we have seen in COVID. We're seeing over 24% of those deaths that are being reported are African-Americans, yet African-Americans make up less than 13% of the population, now increases um, that fervor, increases the call uh, for an examination of policing in the US, um, and those policies are now coming at head. It's now we're adding social media, we're adding in additional context. So these protests may, may seem like they have, are what we've seen in the past, but there have been so many people, so many areas that have said these protests are different because it's now forced this conversation um, into the homes of so many individuals, but also into corporations, um, into places that we've not seen these conversations. And now there's been more attention being paid 
to more so of Black Lives Matter and what does that mean um, as we move forward as a country. Next slide. And these conversations are different um, just because if we're framing this in higher education context, we also think about this impact on some of our colleagues. And as we're watching this unfold, there have now been viral movements, notably on Twitter, where uh, there was a hashtag, uh, Black in the Ivory, that was started less than you know, a month ago, um, but that ended up populating over 60,000 tweets. And there were, um, there were people from the, the African diaspora, Black in the Ivory, who started to charge um, higher education in particular with perpetuating the exact same inequities that we've seen historically um, throughout so many systems of the, of the US in particular. And this hashtag was utilized to recount their own personal experiences with racism in ways that it's manifested even in academic spaces where academic freedom and the broadening of who we are in cultural diversity have been of course championed for years, but that has not been the case for so many people. Um, this hashtag actually became so popular, it was covered by the Chronicle of Higher Education. But one of the reasons why this is introduced now and to frame our thinking is because as many of us may be uh, higher education professionals, this too is something that we're seeing as far as a reclaiming of not only a message, but a need to also to place institutions of higher learning on notice as to say that this very system that's being fought in, out in the streets as far as the national protests are now trickling into parts um, of our society, including higher education, and that these are issues that we have to start to address in order for us to really um, become that institutions or become the institutions in which we not only value academic freedom, but we value the diversity and the aspects of who, who makes up, of course, those institutions, not just through our words, but through our actions and the progression of people of color. Next slide. And then finally, the students. Um, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln actually released each year um, a Husker student power survey. Um, last year was distributed to over 4,000 first year students. And this is notable um, just because some of the responses, especially for the response that indicates the racial, ethnic, or cultural background, um, we received 156 respondents actually responded to this question saying, I sometimes feel alone or isolated because of my racial, ethnic, or cultural background indicates to us, one, the disconnect between uh, racial, ethnic, and cultural background to those feelings of belongingness. And so as we're thinking about this and as we're framing again the national protests, we're thinking about COVID, and we're thinking about so many of these elements, this is why this movement that, that I mentioned earlier, this is why it feels so different. Um, notably because we're adding all these elements just to indicate um, systemic inequities and how they have perpetuated so many different areas and how can we start now start as those who are really interested in perhaps developing curriculum, engaging community in larger conversations on anti-racism and ways to strategically think about how we move forward to actually include others in this conversation and to create opportunities of, of equity. Next slide. And I do want to hand it over now at this point to my colleague, Dr. Fagan. All right, so thank you so much. Dr. Friday for just, uh, that was great, just setting the groundwork in terms of why is this happening, what's the language, and helping us understand where all of this is coming from. So I really appreciated that information. What we're going to do now is move into poll number two. So we're asking you to tell us what describes you most accurately um, when it comes to talking about race. So we're asking you to fill this out and we want to hear from you. There is no right or wrong answer. Be as honest and sincere as you can. All right, so it looks like we have no one that would rather not talk about racism or race. We have 1% that says, I'm very uncomfortable talking about race or racism, 8% who are uncomfortable, 
43% of you, the majority are, I'm sometimes uncomfortable. And then 36% that says, I'm usually comfortable talking about race or racism. And then 11% that say, I'm very comfortable talking about race or racism. So um, as we move into this next section, I think it's really important for you to be able to say, what is it that causes my discomfort or my comfort level when it comes to talking about race or racism? Next slide, please. Inclusion shows up in how people feel about their workplace or their classroom or the environment, the community that they live in. But I think a lot of times people uh, misunderstand and think diversity and inclusion are synonymous terms. Diversity represents the differences we possess as human beings based on a variety of things. And inclusion is how we take all of our differences, put them together and become a cohesive team to be able to work well together and accomplish things that we set out to do and do it while we honor and respect one another. So the key is we have diversity in our communities, in our organizations, in our schools. How do we become inclusive? And that has a lot to do with who we are as educators, as leaders, as colleagues, as friends, neighbors, and just how we show up into the different spaces that we interact with people. Next slide, please. The reason inclusion is so hard is because our brains are wired for bias. So um, if you're familiar with Dr. Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, or Dr. Mladenow's, uh, the subliminal book, he, they basically talk about the idea of the brain as being multiple parts, but the two parts that affect how we think and how we make decisions are our limbic system and our frontal lobe. Our limbic system is the oldest part of our brain. Um, neurobiologists would tell you this is from our reptilian, this is what remains from our reptilian days. So this is also called our reptilian brain. This part of our body is designed to keep us safe. So it works automatically fast. It's emotional. Not surprisingly, it's stereotypic. So what that means is that information that I have received over and over and over again has now been internalized and moved into my limbic system so that when I am walking down the street and I see a person of color approaching me, I will automatically cross the street. Why? It's because my fast brain is triggering danger. Why? Because this is the message that I have been told over and over and over again since I was very young and I've begun to believe it. So that's how racism shows up. That's how bias shows up without people really consciously thinking about it. Now our frontal lobe is our slower brain. It's our brain that gets us to really think, is that true? The thing about the frontal lobe is because it's the last part of our brain to develop, the research shows in men it develops in their mid to late 20s, fully develops, in women in early to mid 20s. So what happens is because this is the last part of our brain to be fully developed, it's the first part of our brain that goes offline when we are feeling uncomfortable. And in the class I teach, and I call it emotional hijacking, when we feel emotionally hijacked, our ability to slow down and think through logical things and make conscious decisions is inhibited. So what we do is we act out of our limbic brain. And so our brain is wired for bias. We have to work very hard and be very intentional to ensure that we're not operating out of our bias. So next slide, please. And the thing about this right now, this, the challenge that we're experiencing right now is a lot of us are operating in a state where we are emotionally hijacked. Because if we think about our experience, our um, thought processes, how we've come to think about race, um, diversity, inclusion, racism, the experiences we've had has created a mindset for us. So the ex differences we've experienced, we've begun to give meaning to them. 
And so that meaning, the way that we give meaning to it has become our mindset. This framework, the intercultural development continuum, which has an assessment that comes with it, is a wonderful framework for us to understand how people give meaning to difference. So depending on where I fall in this framework will depend on how I'm experiencing the current events in our country right now. So if I'm in minimization, uh, you might hear people saying, but we're all God's children, why can't we get along? We all want the same things, human beings are basically the same, we bleed red. When majority of the employees, the leaders in an organization are in minimization, the policies in the organization become universalist, which means you have to fit into this box, this idea that we have, otherwise you don't belong in this space. So when we think about it, and I'm working with our police department um, right now, our leaders in our police department, and saying, how does that lens of universalist impact people who behave differently than what we expect? Because the universalist lens falls in the monocultural mindset, we have to be able to get officers moving into the intercultural mindset of acceptance and adaptation. So what I do a lot of times is I use this, this model as a way to help individuals begin to connect with what is it that I'm thinking, that I'm feeling, and speak out of that and connect with each other from that angle. If you have not read the article, Trauma-Informed Teaching out of the Chronicle of Higher Education, we're going to put the link for it um, in our Q&A. I highly recommend that you read that because what you're seeing, what you're going to have is students who are going to be coming into the classroom that are not just coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, but if you've got students of color, uh, biracial, um, black, international students, you've got people coming into your classroom that are not white, and even some of your white students are going to be dealing with some of the issues of trauma. So it's really important for you to understand how do we speak this? How do we connect with people? Um, next slide, please. So using the assessment, the IDI assessment, one of the things that I've done is I have given that assessment uh, about 7,500 assessments since 2007 when I began working with the assessment. And I usually, when I talk about this, I ask individuals, give me examples of places where you have felt most included and places where you have felt excluded. And the things that I hear have to do with the two basic human needs, the, the need to belong and the need to know that you matter and your differences matter and that people see you fully. So when you hear someone say, I don't see color to the person who is uh, brown or black, basically what you're saying, a piece of you doesn't matter to me. That's what they hear. So it's really important that you understand how people perceive mattering and belonging. What I see is inclusion is really difficult for people to describe and very seldom have they felt it. So high rates of low mattering and low belonging, low mattering and high belonging, high mattering and low belonging. Not very often do I hear people say, I feel like I belong and that I matter. And the language that people use when they talk about that is leaders, whether that is the classroom teacher, that is the board member, the um, leader in the organization, leader, I feel like I can be my whole self and I feel like that because my difference exists, I am viewed as having value added, that my experiences add value to our team, that people want to hear things from my perspective. Um, next slide, please. And I'm going to hand things over to Dr. Friday. Thank you so much, Dr. Fagan. That's very informative, um, especially as we're thinking about this in our own, of course, our own cultural context. Um, as we're watching everything unfold before our very eyes, um, it's very difficult to not see that from your own perspective. So I think that adds so much balance. Um, and it adds, of course, more context for us who may be struggling 
um, to better understand in ways that we do want to be more inclusive in our thinking, but perhaps we don't know how to move from, from where we are to get to where we want to be. So I think that's very helpful. And as you're thinking about this, and I noted this earlier, um, one of the things that's been rising in so much, um, I should say, in interest is how do I now move from being empathetic, um, move, move from just looking at what's happening, and how do I actually move to be an anti-racist? Um, and like I said, this is an action. It's very action-based. So there are a few things I would like for you, um, that we'd like for you to think about as you're thinking about this, um, which is first, we want to stop thinking of things in terms of black, white. We want to start thinking about this in terms of, stop thinking in terms of, I'm not a racist. Um, because it's the first thing we think of it more so. I said something, it's harmful, but it's not enough to say, I'm not racist. Uh, what we want you to do is to stop. That's a, that's a reflex, of course, but it's also, um, it's a way to con continue to hold us back from moving from those thoughts, those feelings, more to now going towards the action. So by reflexing uh, or reflectively defining that uh, yourself as a, a non-racist, um, you're essentially going beyond racism's firm grip and you're making it possible to see how your own ideas, your thoughts, your actions could be indeed racist. Um, what we want to start thinking is how can I champion anti-racist ideas and policies? So for example, um, if you're thinking about this, how do I use my current position of power? Um, and that could be in a lineage of ways how do I just start thinking about ways I can start advocating um, for more inclusion? I can start becoming the ambassador, the advocate. Um, and the point of this is to commit to uh, some form of action, of course, but also this has the potential to actually change racist policies. Um, because structurally, those policies can exist in, in a number of ways that can be very exclusionary uh, for African Americans, for people of color in general, and we want to make sure that we're championing anti-racist ideas and policy. And to go back to the stuff saying I'm not racist, one thing you can and make that action-based, um, and the example provided um, is more so of a white liberal who considers themselves not to be racist, but again, some of the things that you refuse to do, such as sending your child to a local school, um, which is predominantly uh, children of color, for example, African-American children, it can be high poverty, et cetera. And one of the things, that you can consider doing is think of and reframe why you're even thinking the way of sending your child there. I mean, this is just an example. There's so many different things we should start being thinking about how to be action-based. And of course, um, identifying racial inequities and disparities, which we can find throughout. When we say systemic, we mean systemic. So you're thinking about healthcare, uh, criminal justice reform, education, income, unemployment or employment, and then home ownership. I think we've all heard um, the saying about when it comes to income or more so the disparity in pay for, um, for example, men and women, there's a huge difference in the pay gap. Uh, for every uh, $1 being made by a white male, for example, um, a white female perhaps makes 76 cents, which again is one of those disparities that we see that exists. But then now we add in another layer there. We intersect those identities and we think about black American women. And then we think about um, perhaps even Latino women, et cetera. It goes beyond that 76. And we're thinking more so now, going below 70%, and going to 63 cents on the dollar, et cetera. So you wanna look at those racial inequities and disparities. And I mentioned a little bit earlier, thinking about COVID and its impact, of course, its impact has been felt um, throughout the globe, as we know, but there has been an absolute disproportionate impact on communities of color. And if we think about and look at those layers, how can we start to advocate for, for more um, access to equitable health and looking at the policies that currently exist? And then of course, understand how your anti-racism needs to be, inter be intersectional. As we're thinking about this, um, one of the things that we've heard many times is that when we're looking at it, we're thinking about intersectionality when it comes to gender, um, gender identity. Um, we're also thinking about sexuality. We're thinking about so many different components who make people who they are. So we're looking at how our anti-racism needs to actually be equitable in the lens that it's, it's actually applying to. And we provide this graph, um, which is a part of Ibram Kendi's um, How to Be an Anti-Racist. This graph was actually made by um, an individual who read that book and created a graph, and we attributed that information to him. But this is a spectrum, and it's something that we have to continue to think about as we're thinking about ways to be anti-racist, because part of that journey 
is to know that there is no perfect anti-racist. Um, part of the beauty of it is that we continuously strive um, to improve just because we know that systemically the issues, the inequities are quite um, deep and they are um, frequent in many spaces. Next slide, please. And apologies so you can hear that, that thunder that's coming outside. Um, we have another poll for you. This poll is um, based in resources. Do you currently possess the proper resources, literature, that could be your media, um, to engage in anti-racism work? Yes, I have quite a few resources. I have resources, but can use more from area experts, or I have limited to no resources and don't know where to start. A few more seconds for that poll. Do you currently possess the proper resources to engage in anti-racism work? Okay. And it seems we have 21% that says, yes, I have quite a few resources. 64% who says, who said, I have resources, but I could use more from area experts. And then 15%, I have limited to no resources and I don't know where to start. Thank you so much for those that did take that poll. Again, thank you. And then we'll start next slide. And now we're going to talk a little about facilitating that change. All right. Thank you. You know what you were talking about, Dr. Friday, with the um, being able to have a conversation and being able to look at ourselves. This is what I want my students to be able to do. When I work with organizations, when I work with leaders, this is what I want them to be able to do. I want to create opportunities for them to do as much introspection as possible. When you look at this picture, are you looking at the front view or are you looking at the side profile? You don't have to answer the question to me, but I just want you to think about that a little bit. The reason for that question is because we each see things differently. And I love the quote uh, by Anise Nin, who was a 19th century French American poet that said, we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. So giving people the opportunity to be able to share their perspectives with each other and being able to suspend our judgment to listen to people is one of the best gifts we can give each other during this season and beyond. One of the things when I work um, with individuals is to say, don't ask why questions. Why questions? When you're trying to create introspection, why questions create deflection? What a why question does is causes a person to defend their position. So when you want someone to reflect about something, ask a question of help me understand whatever, or what is it about this that makes you think, feel this way, rather than why do you say that? Why do you think that? That puts people on the defensive. The other thing I encourage people to do is to share your story. I call it the crucible moment story. The crucible moment story is a, is a season or something that happens in your life that shifts your thinking, shifts how you perceive things. We all have those crucible moments if we think about it. One of the questions I ask my students, actually it's the question that frames the class that I teach at the beginning to the end, who would you be most afraid to bring home as your future spouse? I ask that question not because I want them to think negatively of their family or to say that your values or beliefs are wrong, but I want them to be, get, take their unconscious bias, identify where it comes from and sit with it and begin to explore how that bias is limiting their ability to lead, their ability to connect with people who are different than them. 
And so the entire semester is, is spent around the idea of if you are going to be an inclusive leader, you need to understand yourself, understand your biases, understand how those are keeping you from creating that inclusive environment. Then when you understand that bias, you need to hold yourself accountable to it. You need to suspend judgment and you need to be able to, if you're in decision making, you know, you're going to hire someone. Am I making the decision to hire a person A instead of person B because of my own bias? What is how, what is the role my bias is playing in this? So I want people to be able to sit with the questions that are difficult as a way to gain introspection into themselves and who they are and how they want to show up. Here's the thing about asking these kinds of questions. Some of the, the in, my, in my research when I did my doctorate, I found that leaders who were supportive during seasons that are challenging created an environment that allowed the employee to grow, to feel safe, to want to explore those challenging things. So I would say, for us as educators, it's a challenging season. We need to create a supportive environment. Supportive environment means who you are matters to me as much as what you do. That's what a supportive environment does. Through my actions and my words, I am able to share that, to, to be there for individuals to say, I want to help you to succeed. What is it that you need? And how is my bias getting in the way of me being able to do that? Next slide, please. Um, there, Dr. Susla, Dr. Henwood, Dr. Dale out of Australia have been working in the area of multi-braining and basically helping us to understand the link between the gut brain, the heart brain, and our cognitive brain, so our head brain. Basically, what we know is when people, when I ask questions that are challenging of my students and of leaders that I work with, it's not that I want to make them feel bad, but it's that I want them to begin to tune into their gut reaction. Uh, Dr. Breslin, who's an interculturist, has done work in the area of intercultural communication, says, we have our strongest gut reactions when our values are either violated or ignored. Our cultural values, whether that is, I want people to treat each other with respect. My idea of respect might be very different than Dr. Friday's idea of respect. I might think respect is you don't make direct eye contact with me. So when someone makes direct eye contact with me, I have this gut reaction that says, uh oh, something's wrong. What I need to do is to pay attention to that and use that as a way to learn about myself when I encounter situations that are going against what my thoughts are, what my beliefs are. Again, this is a way for us to do anti-racist work internally. We do the anti-racist work in here as we are doing it out there. So none of us ever arrive at that place of we're not racist anymore. Next slide and I'll hand things back over to Dr. Friday. Thank you, Dr. Fagan. So as we're thinking about this, especially in terms of um, community action or community building, uh, one of the things that we want to note is um, community strategies to end structural racism and support. Um, as we're thinking about racial healing <clears throat> and place-based initiatives to address these, uh, I should say, these systemic issues. Uh, these, the systemic issues are so important to enforce. Um, because I want to note that because just as much as it took to create these organizations and to create mindsets, it takes just as much effort uh, to dismantle, to, to start that, that area, um, not only of collective understanding, uh, but there are many, the, many times now how we move from that to more understanding and think about ways that we can be ambassadors for that. So because one of the um, consequences of inequities are, if you're thinking about this, has been structured racial inequities, we want to start thinking about how we can focus on change strategies. And as we're looking at this graph that was provided by Visions Inc., um, we're looking at it, one, as a funnel, meaning that all these areas are being touched and all of them are impacting one another. We're looking at this on a personal level, interpersonal, uh, institutional, and cultural. They're all connected. And this, the different expressions of oppression are mutually reinforcing. And consequently, uh, as we think about this, each of these levels needs to be addressed in order to influence 
and implement change. Now, even add a sec another third one here, which would be and to sustain that change because we can implement, we can influence, and it'll be a continuous cycle. But how do we sustain it? And that's been one of the reasons why that question has been so frequent, which is how is this movement different and how will it actually continue that change? And as we're looking at this, there have been all types of thought leaders as they're thinking about this, which is notably this time it feels different. And that feeling that we may see um, is that because collectively we all seem to be now uh, paying attention to what's happening. So community members serve as the foundation of um, for this theory of change and how we need to think about it. Um, community members must first experience their own perspective transformation in order for that to be that change. And that's why us doing the work for ourselves before we can become these ambassadors, before we can start, of course, helping others, we need to think about ways our own personal um, identities, um, our own personal experiences with the world and how we've been received by the world and we can then collectively start to think about that movement. Next slide, please. And so here are a few strategies as you're thinking about how do we engage. Um, essentially, this will helps us to look at this um, in, in, a, in, a, in a variety of ways, but there's nine different areas of ways that we can start thinking about it. Um, I just have an individual level, on the individual level, how can we start to have these conversations with those one, who may be open to those conversations? And we'll talk about this a little bit later as far as what are the strategies to have those conversations. But how do I now start a conversation with those who may be open to it? Because creating an ambassadorship um, amongst your colleagues, amongst working groups, et cetera, helps you to then build the political force you're going to need to really get to the heart of it, which is an institutional kind of effort or organizational. Um, featuring community dialogues, that includes all groups, so not just the people of color in your organization, but your goal is to start drawing on the explicit framing of how structural and personal level racism creates and continues to sustain these inequities. So essentially, as we're thinking about this, creating a community dialogue. Um, you can start with just like I kept saying, different areas of people to have these conversations. And how do you break the ice? We can even think about breaking the ice by utilizing some type of external um, resource such as a book, um, such as an article, things that we can start to discuss, or even an internal examination, which is very much, I should say, informal in nature. And just thinking about the, the organization or the community you're attempting to impact. So essentially, what are the areas of opportunities? And let's talk about that together. We also want to start thinking about um, how do we specifically document how policies and programs have created um, unexamined and unearned privilege for white people, helping individuals to understand how these privileges have played out in their own lives, and then some steps. How do we promote this shift? And again, when you're talking about policy, you're, you're really going to have to examine a lot of this historical context. But what this means is not only are we thinking about ways we can change the hearts, the minds, but we also need to think about the policy structure, which creates these inequities as well. And then, of course, communities that are seeking to undo this place-based inequality, and reducing racial ethnic health inequities need to understand and recognize the, the institutional inertia. So essentially, historically, thinking about the history, the ideologies, and the individual barriers um, to perspective transformation, and that, that requires us to commit to long-term change strategies. And just looking at this wheel, one of the things to note is that we also have to acknowledge um, many, many different ways. Explore racism within the local context, which could be local, could be, again, looking into the organizational or community-based um, lens, and then growing from there. Um, but one of the things that this, this forces us to do is to know that there are multiple angles that you can take, but as an anti-racist, you have to look at it through this angle, which is there has to be a step taken. Um, because one of the reasons why many times one can become cynical or perhaps think that change is not necessary is because there's never that step to actually start the process. And as soon as we grab, we can gather more people who actually want to do this work and understand that the work is long, it is a tedious job, but it requires, um, it requires a commitment and it requires us to really examine um, ways in which we can really start to impact that change. Next slide, please. We have our last uh, poll for you. Um, this poll is essentially, as we're thinking about this, as we return in the fall, how prepared are you to lead anti-racism efforts in your courses or your organizations? You're very prepared, prepared, 
not very prepared or not prepared at all. Our, as we return in the fall, how prepared are we to lead anti-racism efforts in our courses or organization? A few additional seconds on this one. Thank you. We have 4% noted very prepared, 39% prepared, overwhelmingly 53% was not very prepared, and 4% not prepared at all. Which I think if we're thinking about this in terms of our level of preparedness, and I think Dr. Kay may perhaps even agree with me, we had a conversation on this yesterday. Are we ever really prepared to have the conversation? to start the work um, because that's separate from the resources. And it's more so now thinking about what are we contributing and what and, and, and how do we become um, more prepared? But at the end of the day, as we're looking at this, are we actually ever prepared? So preparing to facilitate and to teach because we do wanna talk about ways, um, some strategies to actually incorporate into your courses. Because one of the realities of teaching about race is that there is a challenge. And I do want to add this, um, this part because I think it's very important to note is that there is, there is a lot of preparation that one can undertake to have these conversations, um, not to just have conversations, but to teach, um, to implement certain structures, policies, strategy, et cetera. But the reality is that it's a difficult task. Um, just because, especially we're thinking, of, of course, of US cultural context, this has been an issue. This has been a driving force for not only division, um, but in the US, we talk about race, but I think many would probably agree, we don't really talk about race. So one of the things that to know that as we're preparing to undertake this as a journey, that this is going to be a very difficult journey, one that is awkward, um, one that's going to cause us many times to feel our own levels of anxiety, but that's because of where culturally where we are. It's when we've not had these conversations, or we've not done this kind of work, the reality is if it is that it's a difficult thing to do. So there is significant movement that's happening and momentum currently that's calling for an integration of racial justice education into our curriculums. And one of the challenges that we may see is that many of our students that are coming to campus, whether they're first year students or they're, they're seniors, many students may articulate very simplistic models of racial identity, meaning we're thinking of terms of race in terms of, of course, notably, um, either black or white, um, or we're thinking in terms of it doesn't really impact me or et cetera. And then white students in particular may resist confronting issues of race and racism. And that's just because that's been something culturally that's been taught for so many years. And again, just because again, I've talked about the US culture and I don't wanna be so general and say US culture, but there has been um, by and large, um, this limited desire to have longer conversations just because it's a complex history. And then the internalized oppression may complicate this participation for students of color who've had to confront these as not only conversations throughout their entire lives, but because of their identities, it's been something they've not been able to avoid just because of those measures. And so when we're adding in instructors, there may be a feeling of uncertainty about whether um, it's best um, to win, intervene if you're having these conversations or if you even start to try to facilitate um, when those outbursts or those responses may be due to course content or just because it makes you very uncomfortable. And then of course, some of the challenges we'll see is probably there may be challenges to your own authority. And I, we include this graph here because it's important to note the way race is seen um, in terms of, of, of US culture again. But one of the things to note that there are going to be challenges to, to teaching race, and these are only a few challenges, but we do want to make sure that you know um, that this is something that we understand. Um, and, as, and I'm sure as Dr. Fagan would agree, even as people who do this um, quite, quite often, for, not only for our careers, but just because of passion, it does not um, mean that there's a point that there's ever so much comfort that it's easy to do. But we do it because the most important part is inclusivity is, is our absolute goal. Next slide. So thinking about how you can start to incorporate this into your, into your course, I do wanna think about intentional course design, which means that you actually start to design your courses 
to actually reflect race, um, to actually incorporate different ways or different strategies into the curriculum so that um, it's a part of what you do. So first, anticipating some misconceptions. Um, of course, I noted earlier, um, students may have a very simplistic way of thinking about race. So instructors must anticipate preconceptions and ideologies that students may hold. Um, and one of the things you can do and you can combat that is to start thinking about readings, discussions, writings, projects, things that will lead students to start to deconstruct how they view race. And it's even in terms of thinking of race, in terms of only thinking of race within poverty levels. And even thinking about in terms of what does a scientist look like. Providing that kind of material starts those conversations without us having to be, of course, it's more organic. And then thinking, of course, assigning readings and intentional, uh, an intentional sequence, a sequence that confronts those misconceptions as well, which is scaffolding. And one of the most popular things that we've seen is selecting diverse course material. And this is, can be across the discipline, meaning that the course materials that you have not only um, are reflective of, um, of course, different students, students of color, et cetera, but it also speaks towards inclusive learning environments. So you can engage students with alternative texts, explore um, new forms of intellect, emotional uh, social development, which means you can use the arts, you can use theater, video, social media, things that you can incorporate that's diverse in its packaging, diverse in its selection, that indicates to students, again, these conversations will happen. And again, because it's part of what we do, it's a part of your course. And right here, you see there's a, um, a graph here. Four different things we can think about, which is interrogating your expectations of the ideal student. Because one thing we want, as we're talking about doing this work as anti-racist, is that we have to continue to do this work for ourselves as well. So what are your expectations of the ideal student? And how do we start to deconstruct that for ourselves? Understanding that we, we too, again, have misconceptions, stereotypes, and biases that can be perpetuated in our classes without us it being explicit. And then another one, interrogate uh, the content in your course, advising or training programs. Right now, as we're in the summer months, uh, for many of you who may be developing your curriculum, how can you start to think about your advising, your training programs, and make them reflective of what you currently see? And then, of course, of course employing evidence-based racist, anti-racist pedagogy, which we'll see as far as the resources that are being offered. Uh, our office has been working quite diligently with the uh, university libraries and providing a robust selection of resources which will reflect, of course, the um, pedagogies we're speaking on, but also some resources for our faculty, staff, and students. Next slide, please. And then, of course, with intentional course design, thinking about creating a concept-centered uh, syllabus, syllabi that adopt a group-centered model, focus on individual groups in isolation, and it makes it more difficult for students to integrate deeper, more fundamental concepts such as privilege, structural disadvantage. There have been some talk, of course, of even modeling experiential learning, thinking about ways we can start to actually even providing students with on the ground learning, as in making models of students and using those resources of our own identities as a way of telling our own stories. And then finally, incorporating diverse forms of assessment. Um, as we're thinking about the way we're examining and evaluating our classes and our students, how can we start to think about uh, the cognitive development and the typical assessment strategies such as the quiz, exam, research paper, and how they may not be appropriate for all students and all student learning, but thinking about how we can start deconstructing even that, um, even allowing things such as field trips, um, learning objectives of such assessments, uh, reflections on student participations, peer reflections. Um, those type of opportunities not only allow students to do that cross-cultural work, it also allows us to, to evaluate uh, in a different capacity, which provides for more equity-based learning as well. And then on your screen, you also see four key strategies to go from learning to action. Um, and this is imperative, I think, for us to think about, because one, one of the things we're noting is that how do we incorporate these changes in a matter of weeks? Um, some of these changes are relatively easy, and I say relatively easy, not, um, and I say that as we're well thinking about this and how to be incorporated more seamlessly and even going back to diverse material that we're offering. Next slide. Facilitating conversations. I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Fagan. All right. So 
Let's see. I actually think this is yours. How do we, oh, there we go. <laughs> Part of this is now we're thinking about critical conversations. And this is something we can see across um, the sectors, not just education, but we can see this in our own respective um, fields. And whatever we do, how do we start to have difficult conversations? And how do we be, um, or how do we become those facilitators um, to ignite, initiate, and of course, and even begin to, um, to help others have those conversations? So if we want to be active participants in dismantling systemic inequities, racist policies, we need to engage and develop others to be active participants as well. Um, part of being in a diverse democracy is understanding um, the need, of course, for us to teach, to learn, but also to hear those differences and to think about the impact and ongoing structures that prohibit equity. So as we're thinking about engaging in critical conversations, advocates must engage um, in a variety of ways. But some of the things to think about before you even start that is an internal assessment, an internal preparation for yourself, which is laying the foundation as to how to ignite, um, sharing and understanding. And then of course, having some anchors or some standards, which is us identifying identities, diversity, justice as our cornerstones for those conversations. Um, and then of course, this is so very important consider your own identities. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, Dr. Fagan and I, um, but the way um, our own identities shape our perspectives, and it even shapes the way we're engaging in these conversations. And I noted this um, as we were talking yesterday, and I said that as an African-American woman who was born and raised in the South, a lot of my own perspective was shaped primarily by my own upbringing, but that has been, of course, expanded, broadened, and it's been altered tremendously um, because of my because of the work I've done through the global lens, through living living overseas, to teaching and learning overseas, and a lot of that has now shaped the way I engage the world. So, how do we consider our own identities when we're thinking about this work, and then assess your comfort level with these different topics? Because there are some topics we may be very comfortable talking about, just because of our own understanding. It could be because of our own identities, or it could be just because we're more familiar with. But what are those areas that you're comfortable talking about? And then what are the areas that you're not? Because that can help you to start preparing your own, your own um, course development and ways to engage in a larger context. And then determine what is holding you back. Um, many times when I've had these conversations with individuals, there has been a theme that I've heard many times, which is, I'm afraid I'll say the wrong thing. Which then, then, I usually ask the question, tell me what the wrong thing is. Because if we can talk about what the wrong thing is, perhaps we can then start to talk about how that conversation and for you to facilitate or to take that action is so important. So what is that? Um, so one of the things that we think about is, what is holding you back? And if we, we this is not, a, I think, a question that should be answered aloud, but we should think about that internally. Because many times what's holding us back is a fear of perhaps saying the wrong thing, not being well-versed. Um, but if we also think a little bit deeper, how much preparing could one do? We're thinking about history. We're thinking about cultural context that is not our own. Uh, we're thinking about perhaps even societal issues that may not be something that we, we actively may receive. So as we're thinking about that, what's holding you back? Next slide. I would just add that uh, to, to what you were saying, Dr. Friday, that we also need to know what our hot buttons are. What are the things that really trigger us and put us in that space where we don't answer well or we can't engage in the conversation? And I think um, someone put in the chat in regards to a person, another that you were interacting with brought up the statement that Morgan Freeman and Little John are on Facebook saying we need to stop talking about racism because we're creating it by talking about it um, and they haven't um, experienced racism so why do we br continue to bring up that issue so the thing is when if you if something like that you know triggers you be able to know what it is you're going to do what are your triggers and what are you going to do when that happens as a way to counteract that so you're not getting into a contentious divisive dialogue 
Absolutely. And there is this um, many times a sentiment that many people feel that is that if we don't talk about it, it's not a problem. And I think you covered this quite well in, in some of the earlier parts, but that's avoidance. Um, it doesn't make the problem go away. Um, one of the things that happens when we don't talk about the problem, it gives us, of course, an undue level of privilege to say that we don't have to talk about it. Um, because this is not a reality for many people, whereas it's a lived experience. Um, it's sort of we're thinking about this through our own lens. What is that area of issue for you? If we're thinking about uh, the pay gap. If we're thinking about that, what if we don't talk about the pay gap? Will it go away? Or will we automatically, will women be, start to make more the same equitable resources men? So it's one of those things we really be critical of that because one of the things we don't want to talk about is because it makes us very uncomfortable. But that doesn't mean that it's not a problem. Um, and one of the things is to start deconstructing ways in which I asked this earlier, what's holding you back and why are you afraid? And it could be because one of the things that we have to start thinking about is why are we afraid? Um, and that's part of that process. And it's a, it's, a, it's a journey. And so as we're thinking about having these conversations, know that there's preparation that must go into this. Um, just because this, these are one of those kind of, like you noted, these are some issues that are very much, they're in the media, um, they're very much a part of our daily conversation perhaps in our own respective so, uh, social groups, et cetera. But how do we start, which is before the conversation, we're thinking, we're thinking about it as, as far as a course, how do you set up your class for this discussion? And then we give you some ways to set this up, um, which is before you start, make sure you um, properly even prepare your class, your environment, so that everyone can see one another. Um, also consider your goals for the conversation. What are our, our objectives? Sometimes our objectives are not to teach. It's more so to be heard. Um, it may be more so to shift mindsets, but consider what those objectives are and to make sure that you go in with that in mind because your goal for the conversation is very important. And teach up to the conversation. Um, you don't want to just start immediately into a conversation about what do you think about race? Is it real in America or are people just complaining? What you want to do is teach up to a conversation, um, pro providing the right vocabulary and the context because it can also help participants or future participants prepare as well. And then it also probably allows for there to be a more robust conversation just because there's been context. And it's inevitable. You have to anticipate strong emotions. Um, as you plan for the discussion, remember to make space for all these emotions that may be felt. And as a facilitator, one thing that's important is that you may be triggered as well. Um, because again, we all have our, our moments, we have our triggers, and that's important to remember how you want to also um, take care of yourself and how you want to respond if your buttons, in fact, are, are pushed during that period. And then, of course, um, participants may be uncomfortable, but sometimes we have to sit with that uncomfortableness, and that's part of the work. Um, knowing that this is going to be uncomfortable, but sometimes the discomfort alone isn't a reason to end the conversation. Next slide. And then opening. Open the conversation. Um, thinking about how can you establish some norms, what are the expectations, what are, are some no-nos, what are the things you want to make sure you, you start off, establishing some goals. You also want to offer a shared starting point. Um, sometimes that starting point could be where you inevitably need to land back in order to get the conversation that may go awry. Um, but doing these type of things, um, a critical topic, it finds a way into your class. The connections may seem obvious to most people, but how do we have a, a starting point that we may need to go back to in order to get back to a space where everyone um, can, can center, recenter themselves if needed? Um, so these are just ways you want to make sure you're opening that conversation. Next slide. And during the conversation. So during the conversation, you want to make sure that you're structuring it. Um, planning a structure for this critical conversation. It ensures that all the students will have an opportunity to contribute. Um, how are you going to make sure that all the students are contributing or all the people are going to contribute? Uh, will this be something you're being mindful of? Who is contributing? Who's not? Who's holding? Etc. And then you want to plan some ways to support and check in with participants. Um, these are strategies that really will help participants to communicate with one another, uh, with you and with one another as well. And then navigating a polarized classroom or a discussion. Um, you want to make sure you can contrast some norms with political rhetoric, um, which means establishing norms for your own discussion. You're asking the 
parties consider how your conversation should differ from political discourse. So how do we make this different from what we see and perhaps we don't like? Um, creating that as a standard um, because we don't want to get cursed. We don't want it. So how do we establish that? And then you want to also dis stress the distinction between identity and ideas, intent and impact. Uh, one of my fav most favorite trainings I do is intent versus impact uh, because sometimes when we're thinking about and we say things, we are so, uh, one of the things you want to make sure we do when we're doing intent versus impact is to indicate the need to really start to center the impact because then we can stop trying to make or trying to have the other individual um, hear what we were saying, what we meant to say, or even trying to tell them how they should feel, but we're centering the person who was impacted. And when we do that, we can have robust conversation and we maybe start to even understand each other a little bit more. So you wanna reemphasize the difference between those two. And also don't be afraid of drawing red lines. Um, there are gonna be some times you'll probably need to step in, address a statement or pause something to redirect. Um, this is going to be important, especially, especially if there's now harmful information being said, uh, there's a over-reliance of perhaps even some, some harmful information, that's when you probably want to draw a red line. And then also list help. Um, reach out to some of your colleagues, consult with some experts, discipline-based, a lot of different areas who are devoted to these areas for assistance. And of course, focus on commonalities. Look for ways to highlight those experiences uh, from opposite ends of the spectrum who might share things in common. How can we get the conversation back um, to be centered if it has gone, uh, it's too polarized or it's now become quite tense, et cetera. Next slide. And then we wrap it up. Um, and I don't say that, and I don't say these are going to be easy strategies to actually implement. Having these conversations, I have to keep, I have to want, I want to reiterate that they can be difficult um, and they may not be solved in one session. And I guarantee they won't be solved in one session. But the goal of this is to give you some very practical ways to ignite those conversations and to know that as, um, as a leader, as a person who wants to take this on, these are some key ways to really start those to start those different conversations because I can guarantee you as we're not having them in our classes, that does not mean they're not happening um, elsewhere. And we wanna make sure that if we're devoted to this, that we're providing the resources, we're providing the guidance as much as we can, even if it makes us uncomfortable. So as we're wrapping up the discussion um, and as a facilitator, and you're asking for anonymous feedback and you've given them ways to do that, go make sure you're summarizing what you've heard, what you've learned yourself, Revisit the goals, share your appreciation for those who were who were brave enough to speak. Um, and who, and of course, some of them who did that actually emotional label because some, some students, especially those who may hold that identity or hold those identities have done emotional labor to, to continuously uh, advocate for themselves. So share that appreciation, allow time and space to debrief. This is so important because many times after we've concluded the conversation, we allow two minutes or so and we dismiss but allowing time to breathe and debrief um, and try to end it on what was learned. Uh, how can we let go of these emotions? What are our next steps? What are the strategies to help us to learn from one another? Leave them and provide them with those tools because they will need those tools. And this solicit that anonymous feedback um, without penalty. You wanna hear back from those participants in ways they felt uncomfortable, how did they contribute, and why were they reluctant to critique, et cetera. Like, allow them that space provide that, that feedback. And then of course, plan for that follow-up. Um, providing them with some resources such as an article, a quote, a book to read, a documentary to watch, that's always great because you're giving them more to feed um, that understanding, to feed that growth and that learning that's going to be imperative to continue on in the learning process. Now we're going to share with you a couple of examples of um, activities. We're going to provide these to you. I use these activities when I facilitate dialogue, um, whether it's with my, in my class with students or with an organization I'm working with. It's a wonderful way to have individuals um, complete, the, complete the worksheet and then think about it and come together with another person, talk about it and then be able to come together as small groups and talk in small groups about it. You know, I think the, the one that really can help students uh, or help individuals uh, feel the safest in talking about this is when they can talk about 
the, the emotions that are, is, are generated in relation to a piece of their identity and the impact that it has on the team. So I'll use myself, for example, I'm originally from Iran and English is a second language for me. And I arrived here um, just two months as an, uh, two months before the US hostages were taken. And I was an unaccompanied minor, 15 years old in a boarding school in the heart of central Florida, um, KKK country. So for me, when issues of um, language, race, ethnicity, um, uh, national origin, those kinds of things come up, I know that those are trigger points for me. And I know the emotional reaction that I have, and I go in a shutdown mode or in a defense mode. So any, I know that for me, be, being included is an important piece. So inclusion is important to me. And when I feel I'm not included, it creates challenges for me internally that I have to navigate through. So what I do is I use myself as an example when I open up with this, this activity because I want to create a safe environment for them to share their own stories. But before I do that, if you go to the next slide, this is something that I use. It's a framework that I use for... Um, creating what I call healing conversations. Instead of difficult conversations, I want people to walk away from conversations feeling like that they've been heard, they've been understood, and there's a part of them that ha is healed as a result of having someone there to hear them. And so these are the ground rules that I use, and it's also the ground rules that I use in my classes. So what is, I, I always asking ourselves, uh, what, is it the, what is it that I wanna accomplish from this conversation? Do I want to build a relationship? Do I want to hear their perspective? Do I wanna be heard? Do I wanna change their mind? And I also need to check myself because what I need to know is what everyone is saying or what someone else is saying, while it may be challenging for me to hear, it may not be a personal attack on me. So what I want to do is to be able to think about these things, these statements as a precursor to any time we have these conversations. I was telling Dr. Friday yesterday that um, post-election, there was different people in my sphere of influence who voted differently. And I knew that if our friendship was going to continue, we needed to come together and have a conversation about this. So I invited everybody to my dining room table, and ran to my house, and we had dinner together. We were a group of women, and we are all different political views, different ethnic, race, religion, background, but we were all friends. And so I said, okay, we're going to use these ground rules and we want to hear each other's perspective and each other's stories. And we walked away very different women than we walked into that environment. So just needed to, to, to share this story as a way to say that we can open up opportunity for dialogue. Uh, for, for individuals to, to engage in difficult dialogue, but we can also, the way that we set it up and what we expect of each other, of ourselves and others that are involved, can create healing out of all of this. So I hope you can take this content, um, and we're going to um, stop talking now and answer additional questions that you may have, but I hope you can take this content and apply it to your own personal life as well as your professional life and in the spaces that you show up with people that you interact with. Thank you, Dr. Fagan. And we'll do that next slide. So we did have a few of you that submitted some questions online, <clears throat> ones we wanna make sure that we got to. Um, some of those we, we, were, we were hoping that they were answered throughout. But one of the questions that we did have um, is if we have questions about how to address an issue in class, is there someone we can contact for advice, such as an emergency email hotline of sort? Uh, this is a great question, I think, because we've been, um, this past few weeks, our offices, of course, uh, we've received a lot of emails, a lot of requests for ongoing support, training, et cetera. And one of the things that we have now, and I'll actually show a slide on this a little bit in a few minutes, is that we're, we've created many things. We've created uh, resources. We have a resource page that will be upcoming. Um, of course, our office is developed. We have support measures in place, but we also have uh, different working groups through our office um, that are designed to trickle this information into those respective colleges. Um, what I'm speaking on is the Council on Inclusive Excellence and Diversity. 
um, that's made up of leadership throughout the institution. Um, and their goal, of course, is not to only receive that information, but to also um, spread that information across. So one of the things we want you to know is that we do have different measures we have in place. We have upcoming resources, a resource page. Um, and there has been, uh, following this, we'll have a survey. So we want to also be able to, to see exactly what those needs that we may not have uh, addressed today, but they are. Uh, but hopefully through these different measures, um, this is offering the support you, you will need. Um, and especially, again, like I said, these are ongoing conversations. And as they continue, uh, we'll continue to expand them as well. And Dr. Fagan, do you want to pick up on that too? Absolutely. Um, I, I would say that I, I personally would be available to answer questions. I'm not going to be able to talk to questions that are related to what is University of Nebraska stance, but rather I'm going to be able to answer your questions in terms of how do I have this conversation or where do I go for this resource or what do I do in this kind of situation. So I would be happy to be a resource to you if you have questions and need to address an issue. Um, whether it's in your class or in your personal life. One question that came up was um, in regards to, uh, let's see, was the healthcare, UNMC, how to address instilling inclusive language to all faculty who are educators at UNMC. Um, for those of you who don't know, I got my start in this work in healthcare. And what I can tell you is people are at their most vulnerable time when they seek help. Care. And our work in healthcare needs to be um, doubled up. And I would say the only way that you can improve or make changes is to have an office of diversity and inclusion that's dedicated for UNMC, just like we have here at UNL and UNO has an office. You have to have efforts. It has to come from the senior level down and it has to be individuals who can speak that medical language because I will tell you in my years of working in healthcare, healthcare people are the toughest to be able to have non-healthcare people talk to them. So you want healthcare people talking to healthcare people in regards to this. But unless you have a systemic program set up to address this, it's just going to be on the wayside and it's not going to move things forward. So thank you for that question. I would challenge you to go back and say that to the senior leadership of UNMC. Another question, uh, since, I'm sorry, will you be sharing lesson plans with faculty or something similar for leading discussions or assigning activities which address diversity and inclusion? Um, hopefully this information received, of course, provided some of those resources, and I'll just reiterate again, uh, we're working with a number of areas on our campus, and our, um, and of course we're pulling from different areas of our own professions um, to provide a robust web page or resource page um, but I should say that um, a lot of this work is ongoing. Our office in particular, um, I'm going to show in a few minutes after this, but we have a number of other resources that you can use, other virtual spaces that we're hosting as a way of continuing conversation. And one thing we do want you all to remember as well is that part of this work, of course, is for us when we receive that feedback. It's so critical because then it allows us the opportunity to then, of course, uh, develop and then replicate the, the areas of resources that you may need or to centralize there's so many things happening on campus um, in different uh, different colleges that have created book clubs that have created actual movements in order to inform their own respective areas so those will be available as well um, because we want to make sure that we're centralizing so many efforts that are happening across campus um, that are available to the to the entire institution and of course some of those being open to our community as well absolutely Okay, so one question was, how does a white male get genuinely involved and make a difference? Um, if you're not familiar with the work of white men as full diversity partners, you can Google that and find their website. I heard um, one of their educators speak at a leadership conference many years ago, and they had begun working in this space when I began working in this space back in the 90s. So I know that there is genuine work, there's work that is genuinely happening by white males who genuinely want to be partners and allies and to help create change. So I would say look that information up and there's some good research that they have as well. Um, another question that I'd like to answer is um, in relation to third culture kids and cross-cultural kids. 
Um, in our current national and global climate, we are, we are now beginning to see efforts incorporate anti-racism anti and race equity into curriculum and community action. Unfortunately, most of this focus has been on addressing monocultures. Leaders, administrators, faculty, and staff are often unaware of the intersectional challenges faced by third culture kids and cross-cultural kids. How do we equip faculty and staff to better understand and support individuals that fall into this? I um, couldn't agree with you more. A lot of my students um, who are uh, biracial, bicultural, they are, they are third culture kids. Um, come into my class with challenges with their identity and struggling with how to connect with the fullness of their identity. In our system, we're asking them to self-identify as one or the other, but the reality is they are both and they have been since birth. And so we need to understand their, how their experience shapes, their upbringing shapes their experience in our um, systems, whether that's our academic system or our communities or our organizations. The, the book, Third Culture Kids, is a great resource. I recommend it to people all the time. Um, if you look up on the website, Third Culture Kids, you can find research that was done by the professor. So I think just telling people that that information is there and letting them know that that is an issue is, is a way to add narrative to the dialogue. And to note, um, one of the things I do want to emphasize is that this webinar, while we focused, of course, a lot on monoculture, um, what we do, uh, by and large, is intersectional. It, it, it makes sure we're making sure that we are covering so many areas. Of course, this is in direct response to so much of the, um, of the feedback and the, uh, the requests that we've received. We want to make sure that all of this is a resource. But part of our work is to make sure that we're being as inclusive and representative as possible. So please be on the lookout. We've, we've offered web, webinars in the past few months in which we've covered a lot of different areas, including ways to incorporate these principles into your online learning environments, ways that we're looking at students holistically, meaning all of their identities. Um, and so we've done so much of this work, but we're continuously um, not only creating uh, the resources um, and also advocating for the policies that, that are needed to represent that diversity, we're making sure that it's also something that's in intersectional, that we're looking at this from different angles. Um, and I do want to end with this. Uh, we've received quite a few questions about how do we start working or how do individuals, perhaps even student organizations, et cetera, start to work with uh, respective departments to start incorporating anti-racism into their curriculum. Part of this is, has started a conversation at our, at our larger campus level which is how do we now start these conversations. So these are happening on college, on the college level. Um, we've actually had, um, even on this particular webinar, we've had some deans that, have, that participate, that have been advocates. So I say this, um, part of this change, it will take time. And that's not to, of course, say that all of these will be incorporated into all the classes. But this is something where um, I think you've, you've probably seen from our chancellor uh, the past few days, who's talked about this having a journey towards anti-racism. So this is now an institutional effort uh, we're hoping that as we continue this, uh, that this will be something where we're starting to see those changes or just reflections of this in the courses in the classrooms. But part of it is to say that um, as we're receiving these requests, we uh, make sure that we're always obviously respecting your um, the need for anonymity, but we're also advocating on your behalf to talk about how can we incorporate these in the spaces that are needed. So these are conversations that are ongoing, but hopefully you've seen on the institutional level, uh, the level of commitment now that we, we're starting to, to to actually start to impact. And next slide, because I do want to be respectful of our time. Um, and know that this information will be made available to you all um, in the next day, meaning the slide, the links, the recording, everything will be made available to all the participants tomorrow by the close of business. But a few upcoming events that we want to direct you to in case you want to continue the conversation or you want to know more. Um, there are a lot of things happening on, on the campus level. Um, June 23rd, which is next Tuesday, we're hosting our Dish It Up special edition. Our last Dish It Up on June 2nd had over 300 attendees. Um, a lot of people wanted to have that conversation. It was an opportunity to talk, to heal. I mean, there were many things offered there. And we want to offer this another opportunity. So that'll be on June 23rd at noon. We're also going to host um, My Husker Action, which will be held on June 30th at noon. And this actual session is designed uh, I should say, really to highlight some of the, the very work that we're doing, but it's now going to be showcased through uh, the other actions of our campus partners. 
So we're talking to some colleges who've now started to implement some work in the space of anti-racism or race equity. We're going to give them that platform to provide some information to you. Um, and just a way for you to see what's happening at the campus level when it comes to this kind of work, not just in our office, but it's happening across the campus. And we do want to provide a platform for that. So that'll be June 30th at noon. And then we'll also have a screening uh, alongside, I should say, OASIS and alongside the Alumni Association, uh, Just Mercy. It's going to be a film discussion on June 30th at 6 p.m. And then ways for you to get engaged. Um, if you want to continue these conversations, if you're really ready to start this as an ongoing journey for yourself, we have an upcoming uh, community, a community of learners It's called Include. Um, this is going to be an actual community of learners that are dedicated to learning a little bit more, a little bit more of diversity and inclusion. You'll be plugged into the office. It's a virtual space. It's designed to be inclusive. And this virtual space will provide you with um, an opportunity to be engaged in diversity work, learning from our experts. Um, it can be led by Dr. Karen Kassbaum. More information on that, you can sign up, you can learn more about the actual upcoming community. It's going to be probably one of our most, I should say, impactful ones because it's designed for all of you. And then, of course, for details on all these upcoming events, please visit that, that link that's at the bottom. Um, and there, and the, the link for include is also included at the bottom as well. Next slide, please. And then finally, thank you. A sincere thank you all so much for attending. You will be receiving, um, it was in your chat box, but you'll also receive a link to a short survey tomorrow. This survey is so important. I, I keep stressing because it helps us to create the actual resources um, that are reflected in our community. And visit our upcoming resource page. You'll see go.unl.edu slash echo and call. And then as always, please contact us at diversity at unl.edu for any questions, concerns, or just general feedback. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We truly appreciate you all. Again, I wanna say we've had a lot of people on this call, including some of our deans of our college, which I, I, I'm sure indicates to you all the work and, this, and the amount um, of work that's being done to really prepare our campus and then the, the uh, actual investment they have in this work as well. Thank you. And Dr. Fagan, anything else? Sorry. No, thank you. I'm excited that I could join in. Um, I hope that this information brings you hope that there's work going on, that there are people here who want to help you and support you, and then excites you to want to engage in this conversation. While it's challenging, it's hard, it is also extremely rewarding. And we're all here to support you and to help you in any way we can. Thanks, and I really enjoyed this opportunity, Dr. Friday. Thank you so much. Thank you to Dr. Fagan, who was so, so kind to bring her expertise here. Thank you so much to Dr. Kassenbaum, Dr. Combs, Charlie Foster, who all serve as our, um, they were fielding those questions so, so very well. Um, we had our vice chancellor in a little bit earlier, Dr. Barker. And most importantly, thank you to Jerry Harner, who has been doing all the things you've seen on the screen and just served as such a great resource. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for your time. And please get out to our office and, and of course, that survey. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day.